Okay, so I think to give um, our speakers enough time to um, talk today, um, I am going to um, start. So to begin, I'm in, we are going to record this session, and it will be available on YouTube following the event. Um, I really want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, my name is Lauren Dipson, and I am on the committee for our seminar, seminar series here um, within the department. Um, we really appreciate you taking some time out of your day um, to learn more about some of the fantastic work some of our students are doing. Um, so today's session is titled Current Innovations in Public Health, Insights from Research and Practice. Um, this is really going to focus on MPH students and alumni and how they're applying best practices and new innovations in their work as public health professionals. Today's session is going to be moderated by Kylie Hall. Kylie is the Operations Director at the Center for Immunization Research and Education here um, at NDSU. She completed her Master of Public Health degree from NDSU in 2015, and her specialization was in management of infectious disease. She has worked at Siri since its inception in 2015. Um, so thank you all for being here today, and I am now going to turn it over to Kylie. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And thanks for asking me to moderate uh, today's event. And I'm really just excited because I'm going to learn alongside all of you about some best practices and innovations in the world of public health. And we're going to hear from two of our former graduates at NDSU and then one of our current students. So I'm going to introduce our, our three speakers. So I'll do all of the introductions right now. And then uh, we'll go through their presentations one by one. So our first presentation is from Jason McCoy. He's on your screen on the left. Jason is the Tobacco Prevention Coordinator for Clay County Public Health in Moorhead, Minnesota. He received his Master of Public Health from NDSU. And actually, he and I uh, took many of our MPH classes together. So it's great to see you today, Jason. He has been working in substance prevention for eight years, building coalitions, raising awareness, and passing policies that reduce tobacco's harm. He has led efforts to pass 32 tobacco and electronic cigarette prevention policies, the latest being two local ordinances to end the sale of flavored tobacco. He is currently building positive community norms, working upstream to address hopes and concerns in the Dilworth Glendon Felton School System, which is just outside the Fargo Moorhead area for those of you who might not be from the area. In 2022, Jason opened Verity Presents, a platform to provide presentations and training regarding tobacco control, emphasizing vape prevention. He's also working on the first of a series of novels designed to offer speculative fiction related to substance prevention and other topics. And then our second presentation today will be from Heather Croker. Heather's uh, the middle picture on your screen. So after living through an anhydrous ammonia chemical spill when she was young, Heather has always been interested in keeping people healthy and safe. She pursued and graduated with a dual degree in emergency management and anthropology, and then went on to pursue an MPH with a focus on health promotion at NDSU. Heather worked with substance abuse disorders upon obtaining her MPH and also became a certified health education specialist, sometimes called CHES. She went on to working as the emergency manager for the North Region of Sanford Health. Heather has also received a nationally registered emergency medical technician license after helping evacuate after helping evacuate two medical facilities in Florida during a hurricane. In 2021, she started at Alina Health in Minneapolis, Minnesota. After an active shooter event within the system, she has been working as the system supervisor in safety to focus on prevention and employee safety, while also being an emergency management Man, an emergency manager contractor for North Dakota County Hazard Plans and teaching part-time at NDSU in the MCH program. In her free time, she enjoys reading, hiking, and canoeing, hanging out with her two cats at home, and she is currently attempting to learn the sport of golf. Heather, I am also attempting that same thing. All right, and then our last presenter um, this morning is going to, going to be Juliana Antwi. Uh, Juliana is originally from Ghana, and she's currently in the epidemiology track of our MPH program. She currently works as a graduate assistant with the Community Engagement Unit of the North Dakota Department of Health and Human Services, and she's also a member of the North and South Dakota Perinatal Quality Collaborative. All right, one more note before we get started. Um, as the presentations are occurring, you're sure to have questions and comments. So please feel free to just type those in the chat box. And at the end of our three presentations, I will bring those up and I will ask the questions to the presenters. Um, and then we'll be able to have a, have a really great um, conversation as time allows. 
So Jason, I'll let you share your screen and we can go ahead and get started. Thanks again, for everybody, for joining us. I suppose it helps if I unmute. Thank you for the introduction, Kylie. Um, wow. This was a, a great honor. Thank you for having me back. Um, I just wanted to to share what I've been doing in eight years. It seems like it's it seems like it's gone so fast. That's why I used. If you're familiar with uh, with uh, popular literature here and back again, is actually by Bilbo Baggins out of Lord of the Rings, um, talking about what he did in The Hobbit. But it felt very very familiar to what's going on for me right now um, as my work has been changing. So I started off eight years ago. <clears throat> I was almost done, almost graduating. Mary Larson, my advisor, said, hey, you need to go over and apply for this job at Clay County Public Health. Well, Mary knew that I had a dual degree from UND in um, exercise science and wellness, and the other degree was in community nutrition. So I thought for sure that that was exactly what the job was going to be about. I applied for it. I did really good in the interview, but they also told me in the interview, this is about tobacco control, which is something I had zero background in. Um, the interview went really, really fast uh, because they were running late at the time. And evidently I interviewed very well because they called me back later and offered me the job. However, I had no idea what I was going to be doing. Um, however, we were trained very well to do research, right? And so that's what I did. I got on the job training by myself and I had to dig really deep into the literature as to what happened. And that gave me a really good basis for the work I was going to launch into from there. A few funny things because words matter so much in how we talk about our work. Uh, my job title was tobacco coordinator. And think about that for just a second. <laughs> I literally had a few people I called and they looked at my business card and said, are you trying to bring tobacco here? And I'm like, um, no, no. So we, we managed to change that. I'm now the tobacco prevention coordinator. However, on some Clay County documents, I'm still the tobacco coordinator. Um, the grant, the, fun, the position was funded by Clearway, Minnesota, rest in peace. That uh, It was a uh, nonprofit started from the master settlement agreement about 23 years ago now. Um, and they were funded specifically to last for 20 years. And they had the integrity to say, you know what, we're not going to ask you to continue to fund us. We've done our job. We're going to move on. We're going to hand this off to Minnesota Department of Health and let them continue the fight. They did amazing, amazing work that I was so proud to be a part of. Um, as that really long bio said, I was trained very well. Um, I started at the feet of Mary Larson, <laughs> um, health promotion, um, is, which is not a track anymore. It's been um, absorbed, but community engagement, reaching out to people, talking to them, and learning to pass policies is what I did. Um, there's a whole lot we could talk about. We have 10 minutes, so we can't. Um, but 32 policies. I didn't even realize that most people only work on one policy a year. By the, but I had been on the job for about a year and a half before people were calling me from Minneapolis asking, what in the world are you doing? You know, I've passed, you're passing like 20 policies in a year. That's, and I, I didn't know what I didn't know, right? I was just like, hey, I'm just doing my job, you know? But it's amazing the things that you can do when you set aside others' perspective of your work. So students, oh my goodness, don't let anyone tell you what you're capable of. You're being armed and, and set up to go out and do amazing work. Just do it to your level of competency and security just do it. You don't know how amazing you might be. Secondly was presentations. <laughs> Anybody that knew me back then, um, just the idea of standing in front of a group of 15 to 20 people would, I would be sweating bullets. Like literally you would see sweat falling off my face. Um, and now I have presented multiple times on the national stage. 
uh, have hundreds and hundreds of presentations to everybody from elementary students all the way up to governors. And um, my, I guess my, my claim to fame is I got to co-present with the deputy director of the CDC, Brian King, which was amazing. There's nothing like being at a conference and already being nervous in front of a crowd of 200 professionals and having him walk up and say, hey, you know, my, my counterpart that was supposed to be here, they're sick. Do you mind if I present with you? Like, no, please go sit down. I don't want to go after you. <laughs> but no, it was awesome. He's a great guy. Um, so again, don't let your fear define you. You can learn to do these skills and, and make them your own. And you can be and will be amazing. And you can do just great, great work. Now, six years or two years ago, six years into, into this, my grant changed. Clearway went away. And we got a new fund called um, Positive Community Norms, um, funded currently by Minnesota Department of Human Services. Um, and we focus really, really upstream on the concept of changing community norms. I mean, that's what we all want to do with our work, right? And so if you've never heard of him, seriously go after this and go look at Dr. Jeff Linkenbach from the Montana Institute, The Science of the Positive. Um, it goes like this. And seriously, I will buy coffee to anyone, for anyone that can, not, that can figure out how to not use this wheel in your work, okay? Because it goes like this really fast. Spirit first. We all got up this morning for a reason. Why are you in public health? What is your why? Why are you doing this work? That leads into science. We need evidence-based practice to do good, solid work. You put those two together because you need to, right? If I'm just excited, but I don't have any knowledge, I'm not going anywhere. I'm spinning my wheels. If I only have science and no energy, then I, you know, I'm a rock basically with no drive to get anything done. Then you put action to that put feet to your work, get out there and do what you've been called to do, what your job tells you to do. And with that action, which is led by your science and your energy, then as you're accomplishing it, always come back to reflection. How did that go? Did we pass that policy? Did we make that whatever it is happen? Did it go well? What can we do better? And as you reflect on that, you're going to gain energy again. And boom, we're right, right back to spirit and you just do it again. That's what I've done. That's how it's worked. Um, seriously, if you have something in public health that you can, or even in your life that you can consider that doesn't, I will buy you coffee. No one has won that conversation yet. Okay, so, and that's a challenge because I know we got some really good researchers on here. Um, but here's how it works. For six years, I scared the crap out of people. Okay. I got really good at it. I could stand in front of a city council or a Senate committee and I could scare them about vaping because there's some scary, scary stuff in, the, in, in nicotine addiction, especially in the young brain. But you can't scare teenagers. It's not going to happen. They're on TikTok, guys. There is nothing that's going to scare them these days. Okay. So what if we flipped that plate around and we said, you know what, every single teenager or most teenagers want to be part of the group. They want to be individuals, but they want to be part of the crowd, right? And so if you come to a school system like DGF and you look, wow, we got our grant because we had a 27% vaping rate in our high school. It's higher than the state average. That's concerning. We have a concern. However, we have a hope that that means that 73% of our students said no. And that's amazing. And so if you go to teenagers, if you go to anybody, because who doesn't like to hear something positive today and say most DGF students choose not to vape on a given weekend, month, year, or alcohol or any substance. What if we said right now in this, most NDSU students choose to help their fellow man. How awesome is that? Pat yourself on the back, right? That sounds good. Instead of saying some of us 
don't go on into a career in public health. That's negative. Makes us feel bad. Most of us don't, right? So that's how it works, really. It's it's all about the positive. It's about bringing things forward. And it works. The science proves it. And over and over, this is the fourth cohort of this grant. It's a five-year grant. I'm in year two right now, and we're excited to see how this is going to go. Now, that grant changed some of how I did my job. I used to have four counties that I worked in. I'm now in one school system with a very tiny amount of leftover time in my uh, in my full-time job to reach anyone else, even in my county, um, Clay County, that is. Um, for those of you that are not from here, it's right across the river into Minnesota. So I founded a small business, Verity Presents. Found out very quickly, very few people know what Verity means. It means truth. <laughs> Uh, because the truth matters. That's my that's my tagline. Uh, the truth about vaping is my number one presentation. I've already reached thousands of teenagers very quickly. Um, and it's about providing education. Um, because again, our stories matter, our words matter. One of the more exciting things that I could share with you is I'm currently in the process of writing a series of nonfiction books as well. Um, because I thought about what would I have wanted to have in my hands when I started this job. And so I am writing a book called the title, uh, the title of it is The Truth About Vaping. It's gonna be followed up by a community engagement uh, how-to book along with some stories from the field because I love humor and um, sometimes things go hilariously wrong <laughs> or right for you, um, but just to kind of explain why we do what we do. And then also I'm doing speculative fiction. You can see this is um, the, the cover of a, of a book because we talk very strongly about not having things like cigarettes and alcohol in our media for kids to see, but there's incredibly few people out there actually providing stories that don't vilify the use, but show it as it impacts people and show victory over that darkness. So in a fun urban fantasy story set in Fargo, North Dakota, of all places, we have a series of uh, uh, books that are going to be coming out. Uh, my, my hope is that I'll be able to hand off this resource to parents and encourage them, hey, here's something fun for your kids as or for you as well. So that's what I'm doing. I just had my alarm go off. So I've made my 10 minutes. Thank you. I'll be hanging around and I'll answer any questions you have at the end. And I better stop sharing my screen. Um, Thank you so much, Jason. There. I've got lots of questions already written down for you if, if nobody has any questions. Um, Heather, do you want to share your screen and then you can start? Yes. All right. <laughs> so you heard in my bio, um, I'm Heather. Uh, talked a little bit about my education already in the bio, but um, just wanted to highlight again, um, you know, I have a dual degree in emergency management and anthropology, and that's uh, kind of what ended up leading me to focus and pursue my master's of public health degree. Um, and I also had the, the health promotion track um, under Dr. Mary Larson, um, which was um, really awesome because it set me up to get one of my favorite certifications of all time, which is the Certified Health Education Specialist. Um, it's something that's uh, something that I use every single day, and I'm so glad that um, the, the program prepared me for that certification um, because I think it's the most useful tool. Like what I learned in sitting for that exam and getting that certification is one of the most useful tools that I um, use every single day in the work that I do. Um, and then I'm also, my most recent certification is I'm an EMT. And so um, in my bio, we talked just a little bit about um, evacuating um, some long-term care facilities in Florida. Um, the health system that I was working at at the time um, had some facilities down there. So it was actually during Hurricane Dorian um, that, that three of the facilities were in the path of Hurricane Dorian and we had to evacuate them. And so um, just kind of understanding all the basic, just like the basic health care that you need to provide these, um, you know, folks when you're moving them and, and um, you know, if you have a background in, in public health and emergency preparedness at all, you kind of know the resources that the state is giving you to move. Um, yes, there's going to be some, you know, um, 
ambulances that are going to transport people, but a lot of people are like, we moved them by big, like school buses, right? There's like no medical care. So just being there and being able to support people and, and keep them, them safe and healthy was really important. And so that's why I ended up pursuing that um, certification. And I think it really just helped me um, in the work also that I do now in the healthcare field, just having kind of that base base knowledge of like, how does healthcare work? Like, yeah, it's not exactly like, I'm, I don't, you know, know everything that a doctor knows or a nurse knows, but I, I at least can like hold the conversation. And I think that goes a long way, right? Like we're kind of meeting people where we're at. Um, so I just kind of wanted to just briefly mention why I pursued those. Um, so I'll talk just a little bit about what led me to public health. Um, so as mentioned, I lived through a train derailment with the anhydrous ammonia um, spill when I was younger. I think I was in third grade and I uh, woke up in the middle of the night. My dad woke me up with a, a wet washcloth to put on my face and get in the car and we were driving. It was hazy out. We didn't know where to go. Um, we just knew that we like couldn't breathe. Right. And um, eventually we got to a stopping point and someone said, you have to turn around like you're going toward the train derailment. Um, and we're like, well, where do we go? Um, everyone knows like where the train runs in town, but you don't really know how to get around the train, right? Or like sometimes you just can't. Um, and at, you know, 3 a.m. it's it's nearly impossible and you can't breathe, right? So just go living through that. I just realized that you know communication is huge and how are we gonna keep people safe and how are we gonna communicate to them? Obviously now we've got cell phones, but if you guys are, I mean, my mom, she turns off her iPhone, plugs it in on the counter downstairs every night. So she would never know. Um, she puts earplugs in, she's not gonna hear sirens. So it just kind of like led me to think outside the box. How are we gonna communicate with people and keep them safe in these situations? Um, then fast forward to um, my graduation day of high school. I uh, just finished walking and uh, came back home, walked on stage, came home, was getting ready to go to the grad parties and a siren goes off and we're all like, oh, tornado, you know, tornado? No, there's no tornado. Um, our, the Red River was imminently gonna flood our, like the valley of our town. Um, we didn't know that this was a possibility. We didn't, we weren't communicated that like that that was something that could even happen. So immediately we were just told to kind of like pack our, pack up our cars and leave and like get to the high parts of town. So we do that we get about a block away and there's a traffic jam because everyone's trying to do that. Everyone's panicking. So a five minute drive ended up taking five hours, just inching towards safety. Um, again, coordination and like communication easily could have helped that situation. And that's just something that wasn't um, wasn't done in our town. Um, so just to kind of reinforce like this is what I want to do. So when I went to NDSU and I realized that this is like a career path, this is something we can do public health emergency preparedness, like I jumped right on it. Um, and then it kind of what led me then to get my public health degree was in learning um, about emergency management. I, we learned about kind of the subsect of public health emergency preparedness, right? So looping in public health, um, doing hazard vulnerability assessments, um, and just looking at like, where are we vulnerable in our community or your organization, your business, just even at your home, like what's vulnerable, like what's around you. So kind of looking at that environmental health space and, um, and then figuring out how can we prevent anything from happening? Like, how can we prevent the train derailment from happening? Well, we can't prevent everything, but we can at least mitigate issues, right? We can like do the best that we can. And I think as long as we're informed about those issues and we're working towards something, like that's what's important. We don't wanna ever just sweep something under the rug. So then that led me to getting my public health, my master's of public health degree. Um, some things that just really affected me just with my own life um, and reinforced kind of my job in, the, in, in public health and then kind of what led me to do specifically healthcare, um, public health in the healthcare field, doing emergency management um, and safety was just like my living conditions in college. They weren't great. Um, I lived in like a hundred year old facility and um, you know, I just, ended up having a bunch of health issues and I didn't realize that there was mold everywhere in the in the apartment. I lived there for like five years and just kept going to doctors. I'm like, I don't know, I keep breaking out in hives every time I'm eating something. I, I just got to the point where I ended up only eating foods with like a pH higher than five because I was like, I gotta like figure this out. I gotta like go alkaline. I gotta do all the things. And I think it was really cool because public health taught me to advocate for myself and to advocate for others that don't have what we have. I didn't know, like, I didn't even know that was a thing that you could tell a doctor, like, keep looking, <laughs> like, I'm not okay with this, like, with your analysis, you know, 
I was just kept being told that I have acid reflux. And so anyway, it, 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 it was just really awesome because it's personally, um, you know, I, I lived through that and saw how helpful it was to just get my degree in public health. And I really just want to empower everyone else to like, you know, advocate um, for themselves. And so uh, something that was kind of cool, my first job that I did was work with developing a syringe service clinic. And for North Dakota, that was really kind of like new and big. Um, and so that was super awesome to be able to do that. Um, so like kind of right out of school, I knew I needed to like, before implementing this program, needed to assess the needs of the community. Do we really need this program? Um, then I ended up doing a presenting at a town hall to really talk about, um, get that feedback, you know, talk about what the plan is and get that feedback from the community members and help address address their feedback because it is something new and different, right? So um, I think just like having um, that background in public health and health promotion really set me up to succeed. Um, and through that work, um, I kind of really, um, it really led me into the medical field again, working at, at a hospital. So that leads me to just talking about a little bit about my current role. Um, currently work for Alina Health. I'm the um, system supervisor for health and safety. Um, something that is kind of big, a big part of the work that we do is looking at employee assaults. Um, so there was that Buffalo Crossroad shooting um, at the time that I started there and I was originally started at the Buffalo Hospital. And so, um, you know, having an active shooter walk into a clinic and um, injure five employees and, you know, one of them lost their lives is just really devastating. Um, and it's something that we can try and prepare for, but you can't prepare for everything, right? So um, we can do the best that we can. But I think it's just every time something like this happens, it like it jogs my brain to be like, okay, we need to like innovate. We need to come up with something better. We got it. We can do better, right? Um, and so something that, although we can't necessarily, like I couldn't do anything that incident already happened. Um, something that we're kind of newly looking at and starting to like code and and get information from folks is emotional harm. So we're starting to like not only look at like assaults and having people report assaults but we're also having them like report their their emotional harm level like every you know <laughs> people don't necessarily want to report everything like all of their injuries um and so this is it's really new and it's just it's it's going to take a lot of work to to get there um but i think that's something that like this incident really showed us that people have like emotional harm and it affects their job just as much as getting punched in the face you know um and if not it affects everything being punched in the face yeah it affects you physically but it also um, affects you emotionally and that's probably what's gonna affect you in your life and the rest of your career right so really looking at that something um something new and, and different um really excited about that then also just looking at like neurodiverse patients um, and how we can keep people safe because just looking at you know people with alzheimer's and, and whatnot like it's not necessarily, you know, like we, it's hard and, and some of the, some of the work that we do in that space, um, we have to treat those patients differently than we do like a regular violent patient. So just really about keeping people safe, um, looking at how did we fail as an individual, but also how did the system fail us, you know, and like, that's how we're going to make change. We want to, we have to look at both of those avenues for every single incident, it's not ever just one person's fault. It's never just any, like it's never one thing, right? We got to look at everything. Um, Ergonomics is another kind of area, just keeping, you know, keeping people safe and healthy while they're at work. Um, PPE, that's uh, huge in, in safety field and in, in healthcare, especially during COVID, um, looking at respiratory protection, you know, N95s, which one is going to provide adequate care? What do we do when there aren't any? What do we do? How do we keep people safe when we can't really keep people safe because we don't have the supplies, right? So we had to innovate. We had to like think outside of the box and come up with solutions. Um, some other just kind of areas that I work in, um, safe patient moving, keeping people um, safe now so that later on in their career, they have like healthy bodies. Um, and then, yeah, looking at air quality and some of just those um, environmental safe, health and safety areas. And then um, one of my favorite things is just like looking at climate change and how that's going to affect us, you know, in 40 years. Um, I think we always want to keep a pulse on that. And then I swear this is my last slide. I know I'm almost at time here. Um, so I just kind of wanted to like leave you with a few notes and things that I um, really just found helpful. So anything that I do in public health and in the work that I do is like we got to create solutions, right? We don't want we don't need to talk about current state. Like we everyone knows current state. Let's talk about how we're gonna like create solutions to the issues that we're having. Um, I go to a lot of seminars and people just like to talk about current state. 
Like let's we're we're here. Let's let's create solutions together. Um, let's disrupt our industry, our workplace, like the programs. Let's make it better, right? Like Netflix disrupted Blockbuster. We don't we don't see Blockbuster anymore. Let's do that in the work that we do. Let's constantly evaluate the programs and the work that we're doing and look for ways to disrupt it and make it better. Um, let's assess the needs before implementing and make sure that we include those um, that are actually affected in the, in the assessment to make sure that we're actually meeting people with what they need. Um, think about how we're gonna evaluate a project before starting it. And if you can't evaluate it, maybe, maybe that's not the right project, right? Like maybe that's, not an actual need. Um, we want to be able to like quantify our results and and um, see that they're actually making a difference. Um, focus on prevention, but don't discount post-traumatic growth. So yes, we want to do everything that we can to prevent things from happening. But there's also that really awesome like after COVID, after a shooting. You know, um, my dad just passed away a couple of months ago, and like, how am I going to grow from that? We're going to grow from something horrible that happened, and so I, I can't see it today. I don't know how I'm going to grow from you know, my dad passing away, but I know that I am, and I know that I'm going to do great things, and my priorities are going to shift. And I think, you know, that's, that's totally okay. Like, um, we can constantly change and transform. And I think it's, it's good. We don't want to like, just stay stale and stay in one space. We want to, to, you know, disrupt ourselves, right. And like change and grow. Um, and then lastly, just doing a lot in the, the safety workplace space, um, workplace culture is always going to trump like how much someone's making. Of course, if they're making like fair, fair wages, but like, it's really important to go to work and have like a good workplace culture and like be friends with the people you're working with, because then you're going to be more invested in the, in the work and um, less likely to like silo the work that you're doing. So I think it's just really kind of that foundation to wellness, um, especially at work. And that is it. Well, wonderful. Thank you, Heather. That was that was very interesting, and I'm sure we'll have lots of questions at the end. All right, last but certainly not least, Juliana and um, Juliana, ain't we? Do you want to share your slides? I know you have a few. Great, go ahead and get started. Can you see my screen? Yes, I but does it, it look like the slides are going off the page to others? Okay, a minute. Juliana, do you want me to share your slides for you and you can just tell me next? Nope, oh, I think you're muted. You're I think Lauren, why don't we have you share okay. her slides yep. and then um, Juliana, when you want her to move to the next slide, if you can just say next. And I think that'll work just fine. Just yeah, me. perfect. Well, give me one moment. Can you guys see the slides all right? I can, thanks Lauren. All right, Juliana, go ahead. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Karen. Okay, so good morning, everyone. And I must say that I appreciate this opportunity to share a little bit about what I'm doing as a graduate student in the various field of public health. And I'm glad to be here with you all today. Okay, so the next slide. So this is going to be the outline of my presentation. 
we'll first talk briefly about my country and then why public health for me and we'll dive into a, a few projects that I'm involved in and then we will end the conversation. Next slide, please. Okay, so as Kelly introduced me earlier, I come from a country in West Africa called Ghana and is located it's bounded by Burkina Faso in the northern part of, in the north. And then we have to the east, Togo, to the west, Cote d'Ivoire, and to the south, the Gulf of Guinea. And Ghana is one of the leading countries of Africa, partly because of its considerable natural wealth, and also because the first Black African country south of the Sahara to achieve independence from colonial rule. And I must say that I'm highly privileged to have practiced in the medical field in Ghana for a few years before starting my MPH program. Next slide, please. So just as Jason mentioned, what is the spirit behind me going into public health? Um, first of all, as a medical doctor, I practiced in a rural hospital and then I led an antenatal and HIV care clinic where we saw countless young women diagnosed with and treated for multiple sexually transmitted diseases. Also, the statistics were concerning and then the prime culprits were related to lack of community education on healthy sex practices. So coming from a developing country like Ghana, I realized that community education was very essential and in preventing illnesses, promoting health and reducing healthcare associated costs. I perceive this plight, and then I perceive that this plight would be on a global level, and hence my, my inspiration to pursue a degree in public health. Just to help me hone my skills for research of prevention and control of diseases. As well, I had a keen interest in participating in this program to stretch my boundaries and to help explore the dimensions of healthcare industry at the global level. In my opinion, public health means leveraging my medical education to promote and protect the health of the people and the community that we live in. And it also means being the catalyst for change by educating the communities we serve and using evidence-based research to influence public health policies. Fast forward, COVID-19 hit, and being a country with limited resources, it was very scary. I must say that at that time, even though it was a sad situation, I was happy to have been in the medical field because I saw the various aspects of public health come to play. And this group found my interest in federal my education in this field. From the use of media for various educational sessions to community mobilization, especially with managing cases at home and reporting cases, as well as the use of various statistical methods for monitoring case counts. So the fight against COVID-19 was a personal one, to the fact that I also lost a relative to this virus. Therefore, I took it with all seriousness to be an ambassador for the fight wherever I found myself by encouraging strict adherence to the safety protocols. And being in the field, I had seen the rollout of vaccine made with glaring reduction of case counts and rate of mortality. I acknowledge that it is so there's still more work that needs to be done, but I'm committed to serve at the community level through education, hygiene awareness, coordinating members of interdisciplinary team to improve patient outcomes. Next slide. So my current position, um, through my education in NDSU, I'm privileged to be part of the team at the community engagement unit of the Department of um, Community Engagement Unit of the North Dakota Department of Health and Human Services, and also a member of the North and South Dakota Perinatal Quality Collaborative. And yeah, I'm going to share a few of the projects that I was privileged to be part of due to these teams I was part of. Can I move on to the next slide? So first and foremost, I had the privilege to be part of a team to create an eight-part virtual series on health equity, where I was involved in the background research, focus groups, and reviewing of the various documents created. 
The background of this project emanated from the various disparities that occur amongst various populations in North Dakota. And according to Pew, the Pew Research Center, by 2050, it's projected that about 50% of the US population will be people of color. And such increase are happening here in North Dakota as well. From 2010 to 2020, the racial and ethnic diversity grew at a higher pace in North Dakota. And hence, the need to give everyone the same opportunity to reach their highest level of health. And this is known as health equity. At this call, health equity refers to systems where everyone can attain their full health potential based on their specific needs. And this is very different from equality, where everyone gets the same resources. And this is not economically effective because different populations have different needs. So to promote equitable health outcomes, the community engagement units of the North Dakota Department of Health and Human Services designed this training to provide participants with the information and insight needed to identify inequities. And in this eight part, one hour long H series, we start with the fundamentals of health equity, as you can see in the infographic, where we dive into knowledge of factors driving health disparities, including social determinants of health, such as economic stability, education, access and quality, healthcare quality and access, to mention a few. Then we move on to bias, effective communication strategies, and person first inclusive language, which will enable healthcare professionals to inter interact with their patients better. Then we dive into the various um, populations that have the various disparities, such as the aging and disability, New American and foreign born immigrants, and American Indian populations. Then we crown it with tips and strategies to apply the concept to the workplace based on national standards for culturally and linguistically appropriate services, which is the class standard. So we are hoping that by late summer or spring, we'll be able to roll out this training. Initially, it was just for healthcare professionals, but we are hoping that it can go in for the general public so that everybody can have knowledge of health equity and be able to reduce the disparities here in North Dakota, as well as the US as a whole. Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So in addition to this, um, as part of the NSDPQC, that the North and South Dakota Perinatal Policy Collaborative, which is among a handful of states without the Perinatal Policy Collaborative until 2018. So um, the healthcare professionals created this collaborative to help improve outcomes of maternal and infant health. So then as DPQC selected to be a hypertension in pregnancy as its first quality improvement project. And this multi-state collaborative led to an improved use of best practices in provision of care in North Dakota and South Dakota, as well as an increase in the scale of hypertension cases in pregnancy. So the PQC also led to the identification of congenital syphilis as an emerging issue where I was tasked to research and present on other states on how other states are doing, how, like what they are doing to help combat this issue. Currently, we are working on substance use during pregnancy. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. So another project I'm involved in is um, the project of expanding access to doulas. And this is based on the theory of social support. And a doula is a non-medical professional who provide emotional, physical, informational support and guidance in different aspects of reproductive health support. And this is tailored to reduce the rate of maternal and infant mortality among the minority populations. We have states like Minnesota, Oregon, Maryland, New York, all being involved in this um, project, trying to help reduce uh, maternal and infant mortality among minority populations. So culturally, doulas have been in existence. Even in my country, Ghana, they are present and they are called traditional birth attendants. And these people help in the mothers in accepting and in feeling comfortable because they understand their culture and also help them in making 
clear decisions when it comes to um, issues of childbirth. So it's therefore no surprise that research has found numerous benefits in terms of doula support. And some of these are the reduction in the rates of cesarean deliveries, prematurity and newborn illness, as well as postpartum depression. So together with the team at the community engagement unit, we are seeking to help reduce maternal mortality rate in North Dakota by collaborating with key stakeholders in minority communities to start a doula pilot project with the main aim of providing Medicaid coverage for doulas. Next slide, please. So yes, in conclusion, the MPH program in NDSU has created a huge platform for great opportunities. And I say I'm not the only one, but lots of my colleagues are also involved in various fields. And this clearly depicts the fact that while in school, we also have the privilege to be part of groundbreaking projects. And as um, Jason and Heather also have also said, even when we leave, we have greater platforms and greater opportunities when we go out there. For instance, my work is mostly based on creating constant collaborations where we coordinate with multiple members of interdisciplinary team daily. And by fostering positive professional relations, we are able to address complex public health issues by collaborating with other key stakeholders like physicians, nurses, pharmacists, public health specialists. And this collective cannot be underestimated and the collaboration is essential in improving patient care. These are among others. I mean, when you come to uh, the courses that we are taking and then the skills that we are being equipped with are things that are helping us to be able to do our current, I mean, work and also equipping us, not just for local, as in just in North Dakota, but also equip us for the global impact of public health. So I must say I'm very glad to be part of this program, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity that this program has actually granted me. Okay, next slide. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to share a few of this project that I'm involved in. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that, all three of you. Um, that was fantastic. I would just encourage anyone who has questions or comments to put them in the chat and then I will make sure or I'll try to get to all of them. Um, I do have a couple of questions ready to go. So I'm going to start with you, Jason. Um, you talked a little bit about the different policies um, that you've been able to move forward in Minnesota. Curious, you know, what lessons have you learned in moving policy forward that others could benefit from, you know, in their endeavors to move policies forward? Thank you uh, for the question. Wow. Um, I literally have an entire presentation that I do on that. <laughs> Anyone want to hang around for another hour or so? Um, no. Um, so, you know what? Politicians put their pants on the same as we do. Don't be afraid to talk to an elected official. I love when Heather mentioned learning to advocate for yourself. Absolutely. A lot of our jobs, that's what we will do. These individuals aren't some kind of rock stars. I mean, you know, unless they are and you're working in California or something, right? You know, but I mean, especially in rural areas, they're gonna show up to a summer meeting in board shorts and a t-shirt, you know? I mean, so don't go in there scared, just be yourself. Understand that you have, you have right on your side, okay? You're trying to do something for others. You're not in there trying as they're maybe afraid of, I'll use my personal example, you're not there to try to make their life more difficult by shutting down gas stations because they can't sell cigarettes. They're not going to, I mean, and understand your data. That's so important. If you understand your data, you will understand whatever weird curveball comes your way. Great, thanks, Jason. Yeah. All right, my next question is for Heather. Um, Heather, I think your background is just really interesting being in, um, emergency management and anthropology and then um, going into your Master of Public Health. I'm curious, from your point of view, how does having that background help you be innovative in, in your work now in a healthcare setting? Yeah, um, I think just like having that knowledge and having those networks kind of in that that established network of different different people, different folks is really helpful. Um, I think like 
you know, we really rely on uh, emergency management, we rely on subject matter experts. So we rely on the infection preventionists at the hospital to give us like, give us what we need to, to let people know we need them to give us the data and, and the best practices. But then kind of our job um, is then to be the liaisons to the community. Like, how are we actually going to get that knowledge out there? If there's like some kind of chemical spill or something or, or an issue with the environmental space, like we need those subject matter experts. And that's just been super awesome for me to like, through my experience, Experience, understand that like I don't have to know all the information that's where I lean into them to give me that and then I can be you know figure out how to get it out there and figure out what's working and what's not working mm -hmm. oh, great thank you um Juliana we had a question come in for you so the question is can you describe the access to doulas who are representative of different cultures what can we do to increase the number of trained doulas who are representative of other ethnicities and cultures okay so um from research and from what we gathered from other states what they did was they kind of went into the community and kind of located the various people because like you had people already being doulas, but they weren't certified. So they identified people who were helping the mothers in the community, and the mothers actually brought out people as well. And then they kind of helped them to get certifications so that they'll be able to put them on the Medicaid coverage. Yeah, basically. Okay. All right, Jason, I'm going to go back to another question for you. Um, you talked a little bit about, about the book that you're writing and maybe having, you know, a supplemental workbook at the end. I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit more about the, the gap, if you will, that your book is filling and, and what would you hope the impact of, of your, your work would be in that space? Wow. Okay. Um, so there's not a lot of resources still. Vaping has been around around 15 years. The CDC is catching up. There's some decent resources out there. Let's, let's be honest. Let's also be honest that the average parent doesn't come home, eat dinner and say, hey, let's go on the CDC's website. You know, so um, what I'm looking to do is create something that's very similar to the presentation that I do. Um, I, I take the information, I do what health promotion is supposed to do, right? I, I funnel that data down into something that can be bite-sized. Um, and so um, it's, I'm going to break it up into chapters so that if a parent picks it up and they need to jump right to the resources section because their kid's in chronic nicotine abuse right now, um, they can do that. But if they want to learn about the history, I mean, there's going to be a whole chapter I just... Uh, did on on the history of why is tobacco still around? Because I've got seventh graders asking me, man, cigarettes are horrible. Why can't we just get rid of them in the United States? Well, that's a story, right? Um, so there's going to be different pieces to it. So that's the point. This book is going to be for not just us. This is going to be something that parents can pick up and read. This is going to be something that a teenager who maybe is afraid to talk to their parents because they've been trying it in the locker room um, or in their buddy's car, you know, um, this is going to be for um, also for coalition members who are like, okay, I know it's a problem. I heard about this. I mean, I have coalition members right now that are doing this. They're like, oh, it's a problem. What do we do? I'm like, okay, here, sit down. Let me talk to you about it. Well, this will be something that could be handed off because not everybody's going to be a vaping re, uh, expert whenever they go out and try these things. So that's the point of, of what I'm hoping for that particular book. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jason. Mm -hmm. um, Heather, next question is for you. Um, I want to go back and talk a little bit about your, your work in the syringe services program. So there's not a lot of those in North Dakota, to my knowledge. Um, can you talk about maybe the biggest challenge or obstacle that you faced in getting one of those implemented. Um, and now that it is implemented, you know, how does the community view that that program now? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest challenges was getting the inform. Well, I guess first would be getting a provider to kind of like help um, back the idea. Um, it's a lot of, for being in like rural community, it's a lot of responsibility for like a medical director to be like, yep, I'm going to like go ahead and this is new and I'm, I'm going to like put my license on the line. I'm going to like go ahead and like back this. So I think that was one kind of um, challenge, um, figuring out how can we like change that 
theory that like maybe this is new and scary, um, that this is actually, you know, something that's been researched and there is evidence um, around it. And then I think the other part is just like getting those in the community that would actually need to use it, use the program. Like how do we get that message to them? Because it's really a unique population. Um, and how do we create that safe space for them? like to access it and like where, right? So I think that's just, and it's always a, a constant challenge. And I think um, something that is constantly something that we have to reevaluate. Um, once it was implemented, I think the community accepted it. I don't think there is really any issue with that. Um, it ended up just being at the public health unit. So it just kind of was part of like everyday practice. It really didn't, you know, um, didn't see a big difference in the community in terms of like, oh, now like this facility is being used for this, you know, or there wasn't a lot of stigma around it. So I think that was really awesome. Um, the community just accepted it. And I think part of that is just because we went in it like with the right approach. We like had that town hall meeting. We really got their feedback every step of the way. Yeah. Great, thank you. All right, I know what we're butting up against time. So I have one more question for Juliana and then I know either Lauren or Ramona has some wrap up. Um, information for all of you. So Juliana, last question for you. I want to talk a little bit more about the trainings that you're you're all working on for healthcare providers, that eight series healthcare provider training. Um, I'm curious, have these trainings been done anywhere else? Do you have any kind of baseline data for for their effectiveness? And then if if they have been done or you know, depending on what's being done in North Dakota, how are you going to measure the impact of those trainings? Okay. So from the little research that we did, People who have done, other states have done some form of trainings, but most of the times you have them just going in for just about three pad trainings, and it's just on the foundational knowledge of health equity. They'll touch briefly on bias and stuff. But then we decided to go in more, more in depth into the various populations that we realized were having the disparity. So that's kind of the uniqueness about our trainings. So yeah, basically. And then, sorry, Kelly, your, sec your um, yeah. other question was- Second question is how, how do you plan to measure the impact of the trainings? Yes, so we are planning on adding evaluation document and then pre and post test too as well, so that I'll be able to get feedback from the people. And one good thing about it is that um, we have CME and CEUs as well. So through that, we are hoping that we'll be able to get back information from people and know that indeed, probably we've had a higher impact with the trainings that we've organized. And if there are any things that we are supposed to correct or kind of do differently to just kind of update the information we're putting out there. We'll surely do that too as well. Thank you. Great. All right, well, I will turn it back over to either Lauren or Ramona to wrap up and give you information on our next seminar series. Thank you all so much for joining us today and for the fantastic presentations um, by some of our former students and our current student. Um, we really appreciate all of you joining us and the fantastic moderating by Kylie as well. So thank you so much. We also wanted to share some of our future seminars that will be coming up. So in March, we're going to have um, Working Upstream and Clinical Settings View from the Alumni. If you are interested, we have in the chat the link to register for these um, events. Um, in April, we'll be having a almost form of a roundtable, which will be discussing the role of public health in our lives now and in the future. So we would love to see you guys there. And we also love to share. Um, you can find our um, the North NDSU's Department of Public Health online on our website, our Facebook page, Twitter, and also LinkedIn. And again, we have recorded um, this lecture and it will be available on YouTube sometime in the future. So thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to join us and we hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. So thank you so much. And Lauren, we did pop a couple of comments here in the chat box that March I apologize, it was incorrect on your slide. It's reports okay. from the field, public health nutritionists making an impact. My apologies, but same link for registering. So, the, but um, different title. My apologies. Sorry about that, Dr. Larson.